My mic sounds nice. Check one. I said my microphone sounds nice when it is on. Check two. Welcome all you streamers back to another episode of Barang the Rim. Hashtag BTR. And my guest is a very dear friend of mine, our repeat guest, here for the third time for the trilogy, which took four years in the making, the president of Malden Overcoming Addiction, Paul Hammersley, as I affectionately like to call him, Hammer Time. Hammer Time, please say hello to all the streamers out there. Nesta Dudley, I appreciate you. Thank you for uh, having the patience and, and having us back. And, and uh, I'm really looking forward to filling you in on everything that's went on. And I didn't realize, yeah, four years. Where does it go? Where does it go? And four years is too damn long. I'm not going to wait four years to be having podcasts with you, brother. You were on Dudcast number eight in April of 2018, and then you on Dudcast, that's Dudcast number seven. Then you on Dudcast number eight in in August, July, August of 2018, and then we said the trilogy was coming. It's going to have you in a couple of months, and here we are a few years later. But but we're going to update the folks from the last podcast. So we're going to start off with this hammer time. Peer to peer recovery center. Tell us the update on that. So, yeah. So, um, God, but I gotta you gotta give a bit of a backstory. So, in 2013, we, you know, we got this idea of wanting to bring a peer to peer recovery center to the city. Um, in 2014, it became kind of uh, my mission to 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 push that envelope and with a lot of help from Mary Christensen, Senator Lewis, and a lot of people in between, um, we did it. So it took, uh, it took us seven years. Uh, the last time I was on here, we were at it for four years and now it's four years since the last time I've been here. Now we've got it. It's been up and going for two years. So not long after our last podcast pre COVID it, we actually, we actually got the grant in COVID. So that's when it happened. It, it happened in like, well, just before October 2020, we were told yes. And then uh, that's when, you know, COVID came around March of 2020. But when we got the money, then we didn't, we couldn't tell anybody because we had to do a build out and we had to just secure the building and all of these things. But October 2020 was uh, the month where it, it finally came to fruition. And then we opened in June of 2020 during COVID with a very soft opening. So just so we don't confuse the, the, the streamers out there, when you say October, do you mean October of 2019? Was 2019 the pandemic? The pandemic hit us all. Everything shut down in March of 2020. That, so yeah, does that so mean- October 2019 is when we got the money. That's correct. And okay. that you are 100% correct, October of 2020, but we couldn't announce. We had to hold the uh, the announcement when it for, when we I knew and my partner knew, and then we kind of had to hold the announcement until that February. And then when we announced, COVID came right in March, and so everything got put on ice. Um, we had a very soft opening in July-ish of 2020, where it was, you know, people had to be masked, you know, the drill, everybody's familiar with uh, what we all went through. Um, and then we waited another year. And in June of 2021, we had the big grand opening out back of, uh, out back of the building. And there was hundreds of people there and food and it was a beautiful day. And uh, yeah, so, so we're up and we're running. First of all, bravo, bravo. Yeah, yeah. Work well, work well done by you and your team. I was at that grand reopening in 2021. And uh, and it was it was just fantastic to see all that hard work that you and your team made this happen. So again, congratulations, congratulations. Now, speaking about you and your team, there's one person that I want to mention from your team that unfortunately wasn't able to see this. And that's Dom Desario. Tell yeah. us about Dom Desario. Uh, um, so 
Dom was the treasurer of Malden Overcoming Addiction. Dom was uh, many things to me. He was my mentor. He was actually my sponsor. He was my best friend. He was, uh, you know, it's any person out there that has a significant friend in their life, um, you know, their their bestie, that was Dom to me. And uh, we wouldn't be here today with MOA if it wasn't for the work that Dom did and Dom was there right up till we we chose the space. We did all the work. Um, he knew that that we got the center, and Dom didn't make it. Uh, Dom found out that he had uh, he was complaining of headaches one day, and um, he went to the hospital. and He was in stage four lung cancer. He had a tumor in his brain um, in August in uh, of twenty nineteen. Um, and he 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 didn't make it. Uh, he lasted about six months. He got real sick real fast. Uh, so he wasn't able to 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 go through the uh, the final process with us. But um, yeah, there's a we you know we dedicated a room to him in the bridge, and we have a plaque, and we had a big event for him um, after COVID. And yeah, that that was uh, that was a hard one to go through. Um, but things happen and, and he's not suffering, but yeah, that, that's the story with Dom. So now on our website, we have a Dom Desario scholarship program where we put people into sober living in his name and, you know, his name is on the bridge and he'll live on forever in the city and with us and with our organization. And, you know, I got to tell you when, uh, when he passed, I took it really, really tough and, uh, I was going to walk away. Yeah, I didn't think I could do it without him. Um, he meant that much to the organization and to me. And uh, after some long conversating with his wife, um, she got really frustrated with me that I could be that selfish. She said to me, and uh, you know, she let me know that that I have to, I have to keep doing it. I have to keep it up in uh, in his name, and that's what he would want. And you know, you, you go through a grieving process when when someone close to you passes, and um, that's what I was in. And, you know, so not everything we do is in his name. First of all, you have my deepest condolences for the yeah. loss of your good friend. Yeah. Possibly your best friend, your mentor, one hell of a guy, Don Desario. And I was listening to you on a recent addiction, a recent episode of 02148 hosted by Mike Sharon. And just the love that you have said about Dom Desario, and I wanted to make sure that we get that on this platform as well. I feel as though that all platforms that you are being interviewed on and stuff, I feel as though that you're going to make it a point to mention Dom every single time. Again, he was a he was a dear friend to you. He's a he's a dear friend to us all. And once again, you have my deepest condolences for the loss of your, yeah, of your thank, friend. Thank you, um, Nestor. Um, again, without him, there's you know it. Yeah, that's, you know, we could make the whole show about him, but I appreciate you bringing him up. And, and that's the story. Um, it was one of those tragedies, you know, just a sad story, like to not know you're sick. And then, you know, you, when you go into, because it can happen to any one of us, right? You go in, you get checked. And next thing you know, they, I think they said, uh, it was the next day, they said, you know, if there's anything you need to do, now is the time. I was just blown away, like, you know, to, to be out with him one day and then the next day there's doctors telling him that, you know, if there's any vacation he needs to, or if there's things he wants to see, now's the time. Just life insane. Life is so short. Yeah, life yeah. Is so, but, life is so short. But and again, life is so great precious. to mem remember him, and I appreciate you for bringing that up. All right. Now, last show, Paul, we were talking, which was four years ago on Dud Cast at number eight, you had mentioned that there was going to be three partners to help have this peer-to-peer -peer recovery center open. And you mentioned one of the three partners, which was John McGahan, CEO from Galvin Foundation. So wondering to date, what are there still three partners? Are there more than three partners? Is the is the is the Galvin Foundation still a part of this? Um, give us an update, please. Yeah, so I can uh, just refresh. So so basically I'll run down memory lane here on on why I have to have a partner. Um, when we were going after the building, you know, we, 
We secured the building. There was a process you have to go through when you're trying to uh, secure the grant. The grant was for $3.2 million, and it's federally funded from the state. It's not from the city. It's it's from the state. Um, and it's over eight and a half years, just about nine years. So it works out to be about $400,000 a year. In the first year when we went for it, it was a smaller grant for a one-year process, but the grant, um, we were denied, meaning Malden Overcoming Addiction and myself and my team, you know, we were just learning on the grant process and the writing process, and uh, we waited another year, and then we went for the big one. We went for the uh, the big grant, the, the nine-year grant, and we thought we had it. And um, we had a great team assembled. There was there was 10 or 15 people writing because the grant was in sections. You know, you had a the grant was very in depth on, you know, as you could imagine, for that much money. And and we had a team, you know, and uh, we were denied again. And I at that point. I was throwing in the towel, I said, because the work you have to put in to the grant, it takes like a year of research and writing and meetings and. You know, there's a lot that goes into this specific grant. And uh, Senator Lewis and the mayor, you know, they they said to me, that's it. You're going to quit. And, and I said, well, what else do you want me to do? Basically, what we were told is Malden overcoming addiction at the time. We were too small to be going after something so big. Like we weren't established. Uh, there wasn't enough clout per se you know we you know the the address for moa was my house we were considered technically homeless i was doing everything out of my home in malden um very small bank account you know we we had the people and the means and the passion but you know we to, for someone to take a chance on us to give us that kind of money um without any kind of you know background it we we it wasn't going to happen for us so i was told to uh, i may want to introduce a partner of someone who's already established. So uh, myself, Mayor Christensen, Senator Lewis, and Dom, we we knew John McGahan from the Gavin Foundation. He's the CEO from the Gavin Foundation. He does a lot of good work in Boston. He has over 250 beds in recovery. He's got numerous recovery centers and youth programs and on and on this goes. And um, we asked for a meeting with him and we sat with him over in South Boston at the Divine Recovery Center. And um, I presented what I had in front of me and asked for his help. I asked him, would you would you help me? With the auspice of turning it back over to me, but I need a partner to get it off the ground, get it running, and then, you know, the Gavin Foundation would turn it over to Malden Overcoming Addiction. And John graciously, um, he accepted to help us. And... So we put together once again, we went at it again. And this is since that last podcast and we put it all together and um, we were accepted. You know, that the state knows John, John's well-respected. And um, so here we sit, we're, we're, we're three years in from when we got it. So we're at the point now where we should be really close because there's a process of, you have to redo your application. I think it's after four years. And when you redo it, that's when, we were going to be the sole entity on on the application on the next one. And so that's what our hopes is. So at some point in the next year, we're hoping to redo that application with John and he's going to pull back. So as it sits now, Malden Overcoming Addiction is the landlord. We're on the lease. Um, we leased a building through Mark Gattineri here in Malden. Uh, we're right down at 239 Commercial Street. Uh, we're right across from Panadosi's Bakery. We're in the same building as Core Cardio Fitness. We're right around the back of the building. Um, fantastic space. So we're in there now. And so John is my partner. So there's Malden Overcoming Addiction and the Gavin Foundation. But the Gavin Foundation technically is running all operations. John got the, the funding, went to him. And until we redo that application, we will be the sole operators of the bridge recovery center but for right now there's two of us we're working well together um it's just been fantastic and no matter which way you cut this this pie at the end of the day there's a recovery center here in malden um that that is helping a lot of folks here in the city this this recovery center what clientele or population does it 
um, service. You had mentioned in the last podcast that there is a, a narcotics addiction. There's a alcohol uh, addiction. Uh, and then you said at that time that there was going to be another huge addiction that was going to come around the corner because the Wynn Casino was due to open up shortly after our last podcast. Now Wynn Casino has been here for some years. You had mentioned that there's gambling addiction as well. So wondering if, again, all the population or all the um, folks that this peer-to-peer recovery center services. Great, great questions. Um, so I can fill you in on all that, but I do want to just mention the word Malden Cares. I want to make sure that we get to that after this because that ties in. So the population that the Bridge Recovery Center serves is the population. So when you enter into recovery, um, generally you go to treatment. And treatment could be anywhere from a facility where you go in to get well for five to seven days. It's a detoxification period where you detox off whatever medication, alcohol, whatever you're doing at the time that you need assistance with. Then from there, you can go on to further treatment, whether it's a holding facility for a couple of weeks. So once you are in early recovery and that part of the journey is over, there's when I entered into recovery there wasn't a place available for me to go other than just like meetings at night. So the bridge recovery center is for folks to come down when they have that. It's that early recovery that, I mean, it's for everybody, but mostly it's for folks that are just trying to enter into the world of recovery. You can, you can come down there. You can get everything from job training to meetings to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings to Narcotics Anonymous meetings. I mean, there's they do wellness things in there. There's yoga, there's karate. And mentioning the Encore Casino, it was very important to me with that here that we brought Gamblers Anonymous in. There's a GA meeting that's in there weekly on Wednesday nights. Um, there's also a family support group, which we can get into as we go, but I also work in the field and 90% of my calls are from a family member, loved one, cousin, brother, sister, whatever that looks like that has no idea what to do because they have someone in their family. And the first question is like, who do I call? So, so many people are not educated. So it was important to me that we have a family, we call it, um, the Family Matters meeting. It's the Bridge to Hope. That's the name of it. The Bridge to Hope Family Matters meeting, which meets the first and third Monday of every month from 6.30 to 8. And what that is, is if there's anyone that you're affected by in your family or in your life that is currently still using, this is a safe space for you to come to share your experiences with others that are in the same boat as you, just because you know you're not alone And people share their experiences, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. Because, you know, when you're in the house and you got your son or your brother or your cousin in there, they're locked in their addiction, you don't know what to do. You know, you you really don't know how to help. So, you know, it's a really safe space for folks to come and um, let off off whatever's going on with them, let off some steam, get some resources. And that's what we're about, right? We're about connecting people with resources. So there's, there's just a slew of opportunity at the bridge and also every Friday night we threw in, it was important that we, we want people to know that you can have fun in recovery. We have a game night on Friday nights where uh, you can go down there every Friday night from six to eight 30. You might find 50 people. You might find a hundred and there's food and there's backgammon and checkers and there's cornhole and there's just, you name it, ping pong, pool tables, and there's a game night every Friday night. People just gather. Um, we've got Halloween parties in there. We do cookouts out back all summer. It's just, uh, wow, like I could go on and on, but the bridge offers everything we said and more. Like we have more than we thought we were going to have because once we opened, then the floodgates open to the, the possibilities of what we have to offer folks. So And don't get me wrong, some people that are using, they may come in, right? And it's not that someone that's using, everyone's welcome. But if you're using, there are people on site that could sort of sit with you, walk with you and and kind of guide you to get you the help you need. 
So if you're currently in a state of, um, you know, uneasiness, someone in there can guide you in the right direction, whether that's treatment, they can pull you aside and in a loving, caring manner, get you to where you need to be. That's fantastic. It's fantastic. At the, a uh, couple of minutes ago on Paul, you had mentioned your recovery. I am going to give you a date. And once I give you this date, I want you to tell the streamers about that date. The date is April 23rd, 2003. Yeah, that's, uh, that was the day that I entered into, uh, that was the day that I changed my life. That was the day I made a decision that um, there has to be another way. Um, the way I was living wasn't working. I was, uh, you'd have to back up one day. Um, so April, April 22nd, 2003, I don't talk about it much, but I'll talk about it because people need to hear it. Um, I had a suicide attempt. So I tried to take my life. Um, there was nothing left for me to live for. At least that's what I thought. Um, you know, I was really caught up in the disease of active addiction. I had been, um, actively killing myself for close to 30 years and uh you you get into a place where you very dark very dark and gloomy place and you know fortunately i was i was uh not successful so day one was uh april 23rd that's the first day i consider my first day um, i haven't had a drink i haven't had a mood or mind altering substance unless i've had surgery um you know i i have just changed everything about me um and and that that's really hard you know at a to be a 37 year old man and I don't, I don't mean this just for me i mean it in general for anyone that enters into recovery when you're making poor choices and um you know you become accustomed to living a certain type of way for a very long time and when you become physically um you know you're physically leaning on something and if you're not doing that thing that you become very sick it's very hard to stop and i mean you, you could ask a person that smokes cigarettes right they, they, they totally understand ask a person that smokes cigarettes not to smoke in one day that's very difficult um because it's a disease and it's addiction and nicotine is right in there with the rest of them and i, I don't want to bring up smoking i don't want to ch change the podcast but i just for people to relate that may not understand um you know it's very it's very it's a very hard thing and to be a 37 year old man that never did anything. And I never had a goal that I had achieved, accomplished. I was, uh, you know, pretty much torn up from the floor up. Um, so that, that day, you know, it's very special to me and it, I'm in my 19th year. It's funny. I re-listened to the old podcast. It was 15 years this year. If I make it, I'll have 20 years. Um, you know, in recovery on April 23rd. So that, that's a very special moment for me. Uh, Ironically, and that I applaud. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. I applaud. I'm, a, I'm applauding you right now, brother. Yeah, thanks, thanks, T. Uh, it's a day at a time, you know. Um, I'm not cured. I don't got this. Um, if I don't stay vigilant and stay active with everything that I preach, in other words, go to meetings, ask for help, have a sponsor, tell people where I'm at. You know, I have to do all those things for my own personal recovery, and I still do that. I still have a home group. I go to certain places every week for myself. I have a therapist. I still, you know, I do a lot for my own personal recovery because I have to. And, and if I don't do those things, like um, me, just like the, the next person, I mean, let's face it, right? There are times that, like, drinking looks good to me. It's, it's not easy, Nesta, you know, um, right. you know, you got Thanksgiving and, you know, your family's together. You, you know, it's, it's, it, things can be difficult. So as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm okay. Like life is a lot easier for me this way because I, I right. never forget how hard it was. That's the thing. You, they say if you forget where you come from, you know, you, you may have not have had your last day yet. You know, you, you can't forget. So. Yeah, I just stay on the path, and uh, I feel my only purpose is, is to help others. Like that's that's what keeps me going. I I love to uh, to see the light come on in someone's eyes, you know. Because usually when people come to me, 
there's no light on. You know, the things are real dim, just like I used to be. Um, you can see it and the eyes don't lie. The eyes say it all. And, uh, you know, once someone starts to achieve some recovery and the, and the, the lights come on in the eyes and they're feeling things again and because recovery works, you know, we can talk about the addiction all day. You know, addiction is really tough. Right now, the numbers are really bad. We can get into all that stuff again. Like it's still, it's still a battle out there, but people do recover. And when you do, it's a beautiful thing. Your recovery, Paul, again, I applaud you on that. Your recovery, Paul, is the epitome of one day at a time. Sometimes a minute. One, one to, minute some, at a some, time. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's, we talked about, and I listened to the other podcast when my house burnt down, you know, there's, there's life things that happen when Dominic died. You know, there's things that you go through um, that are painful. In anyone's life, think of your own. I mean, and we all got stuff, right? We all do this this four letter word called life. We all do it. Every human does it, and uh, you know. And what comes with that is happy, joy, sad, love, pain, suffering. Like all these things are mixed up in that. And you know, when you're in recovery, sometimes you want to escape. The disease of addiction is the disease of more. It's it, it's it's about changing the way you feel. So when you don't feel good or you feel in a certain way. And I, I struggle with the disease of addiction every day. And some people, I, I always put my analogies out there. You could use food, you can use sex, you can use money, you can use drinking or drugs. They're just symptoms of the one thing in that's, that's in the middle. And it's called the disease of addiction. Not everybody has it. Some people can drink, some people can smoke pot, like some people can't. Some people have the disease of addiction. Some people can't like right now. My big thing is food. I change the way I feel when I'm not feeling good. I'll, I'll, I'll eat poorly knowing that I'm not going to feel good after. So it, it's, um, it's about trying to just educate yourself on you. What makes you tick, you know, and I've done a lot of self care for myself and I've done a lot of self healing and learning just about what makes me tick. So I, you know, on a day-to-day basis, try not to go back to that way of life. So yeah, sometimes it's minute by minute, because again, you know, sometimes you just want to change the way you feel. Paul, I am so appreciative of you being so open with your past. I knew about April 23rd, 20.04. I did not know about April 22nd yep 20 out four so it's the first time i'm hearing it again thank you for sharing that with me and with the streamers and again i applaud you i'm in awe of you you're doing really really good work for yourself and for others one minute at a time just want to shout out the rest of your team from malt from malden overcoming addiction so when we go to the website which is Malden Overcoming Addiction.com. We have yourself there, Paul Hamsley, who is the uh, president. We have Dana Brown, vice president. Patrina, Patrina, if, if I'm probably Patty, Patty Staples, Patty. Patty Staples uh, the secretary. Don Zanaro, the treasurer. Linda Cochran, the director. Paul Bell, board member. Dan Coe, board member. Mandy Tam, board member. I just wanted to shout out the rest of your team. Yes, and we also have Karen Andrews. She's our latest board member, and I have to get her on the website. She's brand new. She just came in last month. So she's from uh, um, was Hallmark Health. Hallmark Health has changed their name. I think it may be Tufts now. But anyway, Karen Andrews is on our team now. Yeah, and we have a slew of volunteers that are not mentioned there. We have the best volunteers on the planet. There's so many people to mention and thank, but, you know, we just have a a really good core group of individuals who, who really believe in our mission. Yeah. So Paul, we are 30 minutes, just shy 30 minutes into this podcast. And we've been talking about all the good work with Baldwin Coburn, overcoming addiction, peer to peer recovery center, the bridge, and all the good work that you do, we're talking, we'll discuss your recovery. 
we haven't even gotten to your day job. <laughs> you, have, you have to make a living. You have to eat. You have to feed that beautiful family. You have to feed that beautiful family of yours. Last podcast, Paul, you were six weeks into your new position wow. at the time wow. for the city of Malden, addiction recovery resource specialist. specialist. Yeah. Here it is now, four years later. Yeah. How is that going? It has exploded. Um, it honestly is, you know, you got to start off by saying like, when you love what you do, it's not work. You know, um, the city gave me an opportunity. I'm, I'm forever in, in debt to Mayor Christensen, the, uh, the city council. They, they created a position. They saw the need. And, you know, I didn't have a blueprint to, to feed off of. And I just built the position. And uh, my goodness, the, the work that the position is doing, um, the people we're helping. I currently have nine recovery coaches working for me through the city of Malden. Um, so, so let's back up a bit. So with all that being said, the, the job, the job is amazing. I work out of the health department, um, director Webb, Chris Webb is, is my boss. Um, and basically I, uh, I help any individual. I work with the police. I work with all the entities in the city, whether it's bread of life, ABCD, whoever can be tied in. I do a lot of work with housing families. You know, they have the, uh, they have all of their programs going and people need recovery. I work with the Malden warming center very closely, which is coming up and it has got so busy. So we, we came up with an idea two years ago. Um, you know, on the last, we talked about the Malden train station on the last podcast and, uh, you know, I would stare out there from city hall and, um, anyone that listens to this is going to know exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it got to the point where, you know, a mother trying to push her child to get on the orange line isn't safe. You know, she's got to walk by 15 or 20 people who may be drinking, using drugs, gawking, um, so the more digging I did, you know, I know it's not Malden police jurisdiction and the MBTA police weren't around as much as they could be. And that those, you know, a lot of people over there making those decisions and not living well, um, really weren't policing them. I feel wasn't like the best, you can't arrest your way out of this problem. You know, you, you, you can't do it. Um, so I, I, I came up with an idea. I said, gee, you know, we got to go right at it. We got to get in. We have to get in it. And I just said, uh, I was talking with my wife. She actually got me going on this. She came home one day and she said, you need to do something because she tried to get on the train and she had a couple of issues with my young daughter. And uh, I don't care what you do, but you need to do something. That's what she said. So we, 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 we discussed in depth and, and then we came up with a name and this is her doing, not mine. In the name of Malden Cares, she said, just call it Malden Cares and, and figure it out. And uh, so I came up with an idea just to set up a table every day. Take a table, put resources on it, and go stand out there with people for three hours every day. Just get to know them, hang out with them, talk to them, because they're just people. And, and you know... Um, Recovery coaching is the way to go. You know, the job of a recovery coach is to uh, promote recovery, remove barriers, connect people with recovery support services, encourage hope, optimism, and healthy living. So after COVID, there was a grant out there called OPER. There was some funding available. Um, and it had to be COVID related. And I, I put in a, a proposal that we have we get recovery coaches and we go out to Malden train station and see what we can do. So they gave me X amount of dollars. They said, you got 10 weeks. It's a pilot program. Keep data and get back to us. I hired a couple of coaches. We were out there every day. And within five weeks, I had put six people into detox. We were helping so many people in the city. It, it's a collaboration between Malden Overcoming Addiction and the city of Malden. And they saw what we were doing. They instantly funded it for another year. So now I get, it went from 11 weeks to one year. And the data that I'm keeping, the work that I'm doing, 
recently. They just funded me now. Um, I'm funded until December 31st, 2024. I got two more years. They just gave me more. What we're doing out there has blossomed. I have nine recovery coaches. Not only are we at the train station now, now I have a street team on top of Malden train station. So every day at Malden T, you'll see Malden Cares out there from the months of April until November, until December 1st. And when it gets cold, we go into the warming center from the months of December, January, February, and March. And we assist all the folks that are unhoused and we help them with their substance use disorder. Um, So in addition to the train station, we now I've gotten with all the city councilors and I talk to everybody and wherever there's a spot in their ward where they feel they could use Malden Cares, we show up for three hours. So I could be on the bike path for three hours in Ward 5. I might be down in Ward 8 at the by the Dunkin' Donuts on the bike path. I've been with Chris Simonelli at Harvard Park. I just, last week we were out front of Walgreens. You know, wherever there's folks maybe that could use our assistance, we bring it right to them. Like we are just blanket in the city with this thing called Malden Cares and the numbers and the help that we are giving people, it's off the chart. Um, I think the past, so four, eight, in the past 10 weeks, we've gotten 22 people into treatment from Malden. Like 22 in 10 weeks now. So what has happened? um, I have so much to say. Cut me off if you have to. But what has happened? I am not cutting you off, brother. You got to open mic. Go. So (laughs) when COVID hit, when they shut the world down, people in recovery need human connection it and i'll I'll say it till i'm blue in the face we need we need each other because like think about it an aa meeting an na meeting like we go we have coffee we sit we look at each other we tell each other where we're at we need each other to stay in recovery and when the world shut down everybody was left by themselves and when there's a person in recovery that's alone you're with the last person you used with and it's really bad company. Um, so the we went from a 72% to, uh, I don't know, it was 103. It was a 38% rise from COVID when I, when I can give you the overdose numbers across the country and the fatalities went up almost 38%. So now what does that mean now? What that means now is we're about two years into it and COVID's over. But just because like, well, COVID's not over, but we're in a good spot. People are getting vaccinated. We've learned how to live with it. We're doing much better with it, right? I don't see the world shutting down again, but we have figured out a way to manage and live. But the people that went back out to using just because COVID got better doesn't mean their disease got better. So one of three things happen to people when they return to active addiction. You either go to jail, you go to an institution, or you die. There is no way out. That's, that's just, that's the reality of it. You can't beat it. This is, you, you lose. Like if you're going to try to, to go back out there, you you know, it's not going to end well. So the people that aren't in jail and the people that didn't die, um, they're coming back and they're coming back in droves. And the good thing is Malden has this program called Malden Cares. We have set a blueprint and I'm being contacted from all the other cities and towns on how are you doing this? Like we, we are just, we've got connections and we're involved with the hospitals, with the ambulances, with the police, with the fire, with the residents. I'm doing door knocks. When, when someone overdoses, I go right to their house. I bring them resources, um, it, you know, and, and for a number of purposes, I could tell you last year we had a hundred, now this is 2021, uh, we had 105 overdoses and we had 17 fatalities. And that was the biggest numbers Malden has ever seen um, since I've been around. Uh, Those numbers were very high. This year, we're a little bit lower on overdoses so far, but our fatalities are down 70% so far. Knock on wood, um, we've had four fatalities since January. Last year at this time, we had 12. Um, So I like to think that that's because of the work we're doing and we're out there. And I can go on and on, but now you ask, or I ask, we can keep doing this as, till the cows come home, right? The people are going to continue using. We help them. They use. We help them. 
how do we stop it? Well, I have the answer for that. And, and it's, it's education on our youth. We have to get a curriculum that is inserted across the country into every school system that's K to 12. And it starts with strength building and positive affirmations, right? Then the next year, a little bit more by the, by, by the year in third grade, they know what drugs are and how bad they are. Fourth grade, they're seeing videos and they're being taught this, like it has to be part of a health curriculum. And they're doing some of it now, but not enough. There's just not enough being done in the school system. We have to educate the young people so they're not going to keep coming up. This is a generational thing. Like I'm at the top of this wheel and these people keep coming and they keep falling off and they keep falling off. But how do we stop them from coming? And it's as simple as education because peer pressure, you know, and this is, I I fell into this category when I was very young. I was nine years old and somebody turned me on to something and I didn't have enough information to say no. And, and that's what's still happening today. I can get into the vaping. I'm being contacted by principals in the city. We have vaping going on in fifth grade at an alarming rate. In fifth grade, you're 10. These kids have vapes in the schools and a lot of it's liquid marijuana. They're up. These kids are up against, you know, things are a lot worse today. When I was a kid in school, marijuana was 2%. Today, the marijuana that's out there is 96%. I can go on and on and on, but the bottom line is we have to attack the youth. Like, I'm going to be dead. My kids will be dead. Hopefully their kids can see the change if we do it right. We have to get at the youth because, the you know, again, the problem is still the problem. It's not going to go away until we change the system. And the same thing happened with cigarettes. I use cigarettes as an example all the time. When I was growing up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, my goodness, I wasn't in here in the 40s, but my mother and my father would tell me, you know, you had the, the Marlboro Man and Joe Camel and this and, and that. And it was on every TV ad and nine out of 10 people smoked. And everywhere you went, you could smoke. Then in the 60s, they figured out when I came along, when I was born, secondhand smoke. And then people started getting sick. You know, this thing called cancer came out, lung cancer from, from smoking. Then next thing you know, the 80s and 90s, there's a ton of people getting sick. And then by the year 2000, with enough education and enough financial support put into it, it all went away. Like you can't like t- in today's day and age, I think two out of 10 smoke. It's not accepted anywhere. You can't smoke in any establishment. And it was all education. And it's, it took 60 years for, for this to change. It was like three generations. So if you look at it that way, that's how we have to approach this. And the, and you know, the fentanyl thing and all of this stuff that's happening it's really tough to be a kid growing up out there. So that's why I'm going to just keep preaching until I'm blue in the face. Education, education, educate our youth. It has to be part of the curriculum. And that's how we get out. And with that being said, I think this is an excellent time to go into our break. So... Before we go into our break, I just want to say again, go to the website, MaldingOvercomingAddiction.com. On the landing page, if you go to the bottom of that website, there is a donate button on the right-hand side. Click on it, donate, donate, donate again. No donation is too small. Malding Overcoming Addiction is a 501c3 nonprofit. There are tax benefits if you donate to a nonprofit. So once again, donate, donate donate. Nestor Dudley, Paul Hammersley, we will see you after the break. Stigma affects everybody. Stigma is defined as a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. I'm queer. I'm black. I struggle with depression and anxiety. I'm bisexual. I am autistic. I'm half Asian. I'm Greek. 
So stigma is such a broad word because there's so much stigma around different areas. Uh, we talk about stop the stigma in Malden and we usually talk about it in the realm of uh, addiction. Stop the stigma. But there's so much more to that that I see here every day. Unfortunately, yes, we do see students that fight addiction in our building. Uh, and we're also, and they're stigmatized because they're put into a lane unfairly. Make people understand what it is to be an addict, what it is to fight addiction, uh, and what it is to also have to deal with the stigma that goes with it. But if you come over to this side, there's so much more. Stigma is associated with students of maybe that identify as a certain um, gender or maybe don't identify uh, with the gender that they were assigned at birth. Stop the stigma. Or potentially, potentially um, the sexual identity. Stop the stigma. And also we have uh, so much to do with just what you see from a person, the color of the skin, uh, potentially the religion that they practice or the, the country that they've come from. Stop the stigma but we still have a lot of work to do. Stop the stigma. Stop the stigma. Stop the stigma. Back after the break, Nesta Dudley, along with Paul Hammersley, who is the president of Malden Overcoming Addiction, and his day job, which is Addiction Recovery Resource Specialist in the city of Malden. Paul, again, this podcast is to update the folks from the last podcast, which was four years ago. You had touched upon this in the first half. I just want to ask you for the update. The last podcast you and I had, you were weeks removed from the home which you grew up in burning down and left your parents, your sister, and your video equipment, your, your studio, gone. Not your parents, your sister, and your, you know, but the house was gone. There was, there was nothing left. Please share with us the update with that. Yeah, so my goodness, I can't believe time goes so quick. Um, yep, so I did lose my home. Um, we went through a huge tragedy. And last time when I spoke to you, we had my parents, my family was in a house in Medford. Um, and we were doing a rebuild on the house on Ashland Street in Malden. And uh, We've since completed that. It took 13 months, moved my family back in, brand new home, um, beautiful, beautiful home. Um, you know, we, we lost our pets. The, you know, our cats died during the fire, which was awful. Everyone, uh, you know, the humans, all the humans made it through. Um, we've discussed a lot that had happened during that fire on the last one, you know, the finding of my mother's rings and all the, a lot of good things did come out of the fire, but one thing you can't replace T is the Nestor is the, uh, is the memories. So it's very nice to have that home. My mother is currently still in there. Um, it's hard for me to talk about because my goal, like my parents are elderly and after the fire, it took a lot out of my elderly parents. Um, the move was really difficult on my dad. So, you know, we went from Ashland Street over to Medford. Um, then to come back to Ashland Street, he made it back. And that was my goal. And about six months in, 
my dad, uh, when COVID hit, he got real sick and uh, he died. He he died. Um, my condolences. My, yeah. My condolences. Yeah. Brother. Right at the beginning, before we knew what COVID was, uh, he wasn't feeling good. I took him to the hospital. I brought him in. And the next day when I went back, they had yellow caution tape up saying this thing called COVID. You can't come in. And they weren't understanding of it. Matter of fact, uh, they, they didn't know much about it. So they, they told me he needed a... Uh, he he needed to go to uh, like a rehabilitation place for thirty days because he was really sick and he he uh, he just didn't make it. So with that being said, I, I just wanted to mention my dad um, during this podcast, captain of the Malden Fire Department uh, for thirty two years, and so now in that house, my mom, you know, with dad being gone, my mom, we moved her upstairs. My mom is still with us. She's going to be ninety one the day after Christmas. And she lives upstairs with my sister and my niece. Um, I did rebuild my studio in the basement. Much different look. I'm not doing the music anymore. You know, we did lose all the equipment. But we have a photography studio there now. And, you know, again, I I, I look at the whole thing, my recovery, right? We talked about that. People go through stuff. And I had some tragedy. People have tragedy. It happens. Um, I think I mentioned the last time, like you, you watch shows and you see terrible things happen to good people and all these things can happen, but like the four letter word life, we can get through it. You know, humans are resilient. You get through it, but the house, you know, it's built, it's beautiful. We got through it. And, um, and, and yeah, I appreciate you asking, but I go there every day. Um, it's, you know, uh, yeah. Just, just amazing stuff. My condolences once again for losing your father yeah. at, the, at the beginning of yep. COVID. This was this was pre-vaccine and all the stuff. We didn't know what we were dealing with. We didn't know how much longer we were going to survive. Yep. COVID took a first cousin of mine, Sonovia. Love you. You're always in our hearts. And yeah, that's just one one serious, serious. You know, that was very, very uncertain times, brother. We just, you know, we just didn't know. I mean, I go back to that drone footage that you shot in Malden Square where there was like mm-hmm. not no one was in Malden Square except for <laughs> folks who work at the mayor's office and myself at the job along with Josephine Royal I want to make sure I shout her out too we were the only ones Paul in Malden Square it's funny you mentioned that I, I watched that video the other day just uh that video is going to be a piece of history because like no one did that I just said you know I have to document this somehow some way and I mean to look at that video eerie scary eerie like absolutely in, insanity um it's on it's on my youtube page it's got a whole bunch of hits on it but um that one is just yeah i just went out and captured the whole thing and just there was no cars anywhere everything was closed like just it was it's really weird to watch that video so if you can get a chance uh you know maybe we'll share it or something uh it, it, again wow what the pandemic did for me, Paul, I was notorious for years, notorious for eating out. I ate out lunch, ate out breakfast, ate out dinner, often theorized how much money I would save if I just went food shopping. No incentive to go food shopping. When the last store closed in Malden Square, bravo. I'm like, I am on my own, truly, because I was still going to work. You were still going to work along with Josephine, yep. others in the, yep. in the mayor's office forced me to go food shopping, which was the only positive thing I can take from this because now I go food shopping weekly because I seen the money that I saved because there was no alternatives. You got to eat. So yeah, but that was wild, man. Nothing. There was nobody. Malden Square. And that's not, Just to know- and that's not unique. That was happening all over. Everywhere. Everywhere. And if anyone... Now, I just pulled it up so I... It's labeled, um, it's on my YouTube page. If you just go in YouTube and, and you you ask for, uh, you punch in COVID-19 Malden Mass 2020. That's all it is. And that my video will come up that I did. And it's, uh, wow. Again, COVID-19, the number, Malden Mass 2020. It's, uh, you know, we lived through it. Yeah. 
that's history. You know what I mean? Like that's just history. Crazy, crazy times. Right, right. Paul, I want to talk about fundraisers or calendar events that you may have coming up remaining uh, for the rest of the year and all this stuff. You know, again, we need these fundraisers. We meet this organization, Marling Overcoming Addiction. They can always go to the website, MarlingOvercomingAddiction.com to once again donate, but check out the calendar of events. So are there any events or fundraisers that are coming up soon? You're amazing. Uh, thank you for asking. So yes, we do um, two fundraisers a year and we have one Saturday, November 12th, coming up in three weeks from now. Uh, at the Malden Moose. It's called MOA Rocks Addiction. So what we do is we bring in a band. It's usually an 80s cover band. And this this time it's uh, the band Poison. So Poison. If, you're an 80s, if you're an 80s rocker and you, you, know, you want to come out and support us, uh, we're, we're at the Malden Moose, November 12th, um, Saturday night. And there's going to be great food, lots of people, 50, 50 raffles and some speakers. And it's just, um, this is how we raise our money because we are a grassroots organization and we only operate from the money we raise. And, um, you know, and the city of Malden has been fabulous with us. And I need to thank the entire city and everyone that supports the organization, even if they're not a member. Because every single port person that supports us is the reason why we can do the work that we do. So we have that coming up again, November 12th. Then right behind that, on December 31st, New Year's Eve, we do an event called Celebrate Sober. Very important to us. Um, Celebrate Sober, if you're wondering what, what it is, people in early recovery, you, you know, when you think of New Year's Eve, your birthday, the night before Thanksgiving, Christmas, there's many things in one's life that they might go out and enjoy themselves, indulge, you know, the a human, the human element, right? Like your birthday, you have fun. And, but when you're in recovery, those are moments where you may have went out and indulged too much or did too much of the wrong behavior. So you're home, you're alone. We wanted to create a safe space where people can learn you don't need drugs or alcohol to have fun. So at Club 24 at 787 Salem Street in Malden, we do it every year. We invite the entire city down. All are welcome, kid-friendly. We have food, dancing, music. It starts at 7 p.m., goes till 1230. Um, again, just nothing but a good time, good night out, absolutely no drinking, no no funny business, just celebrating sober is what we do. And it's just, if you like to dance and you like to eat and you like to have fun, come on down New Year's Eve um, at Club 24. So we have that. Our vigil will be coming up in March, on March 26th. We moved it this year. It's going to be March 26th at the Malden High School Gallery, where we honor everybody who we've lost from this disease. Um, very, very touching night. That's March 26th, and I'm going to back up two weeks. The second Wednesday in March this year, so we do something for the schools. We call it hashtag Malden Stop the Stigma Day, where we run a campaign where we teach the entire city to stop the stigma because stigma can kill, right? You wear a ribbon, you take a selfie, and, and this is in the schools. We go around, we get to talk to like 3,500 students. And it's not just for the kids. It's for the entire community. Everybody supports, wears the ribbon, um, online campaign. And myself and Dana Brown, I can't leave his name out. He is absolutely um, such a big, big, huge supporter of this event. And, and it can't be done without him. And we go and we speak to the schools. So we go, we're meeting, we meet with the schools ahead of time. And they have their teachers teach the kids for a couple of weeks about stigma. So by the time we get there, the kids have banners and, you know, they got their ribbons on and we discuss stigma, but they're learning for two weeks about stigma. And it's not just drug use. It could be the color of your skin. It could be someone's overweight. It could be, hey, the kid is sitting by himself. He may not be the cool kid. Go say hi. Like, you know, find out about people just it's about treating each other kindly with respect. And, you know, it, it's such a good day. So that's the second Wednesday of March. And we changed it this year. And 
the good thing is the mayor of the city is going to make a, I believe, a proclamation to dedicate that day. We're going to have that day as a dedicated day. This year, we're going to do it. So every second Wednesday of March forever is going to be hashtag Malden Stop the Stigma Day. And this is a really big deal for us. That is absolutely a huge deal. And I just want to add along with that, that Jim Valente and his video class, they produce a video every year about this. Matter of fact, the break that we just had was the latest production 2022 of hashtag Malden Stop the Stigma. Again, this is fantastic. As you said before the break, education, education, education. And since this organization has been doing this for the past several years, this has become, in my mind, a staple of, of, of awareness in the city of Malden. Again, your wife named it aptly. Malden cares. Malden truly does care. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I don't know how much time we have left, but just a quick, uh, the kids, you know, I've been doing the stigma day now for seven years. So now kids, right. They let us get in from fifth grade to 12th. They allow us to talk to the fifth graders. So if any parents are wondering, I can get to fifth grade and there is um, we, we do this in every school except one, one school chooses not to participate in the city. But the funny thing is, and not, for, well, it's funny. So I run into kids now and you know, when you got a fifth grader at 10 years old, I've been doing it six years. So now I've just got to the point where they're turning into seniors and I'll be walking through the school at different parts of the year. I could be at a football game down at Pearl Street, wherever I am. I get a kid look at me and say, there's the stigma guy, you know, and it's so funny because they only know me as the stigma guy, but it's uh, to watch the kids grow, but they know what stigma is. So I know this is working to hear the young people talking about it. It's uh, it's pretty special. You know, they tweet about it. And that's what it's about, right? It's about engaging the community so we all can get well, pulled together. It's a community-driven, like, Malden is just amazing. They have embraced us. What a fantastic community to live in. It truly is. Malden is 5.5 miles north of the city of Boston. Paul, I know you're waiting for me to plug that. You're probably like, when is Nesta going to plug that? <laughs> so I got it. Plug it right there, 5.5 miles north of the city of Boston. So, Paul, as we close out this podcast, probably going to this podcast on this one sad note. And you're probably like, Nestor, what could be a sad note? I mean, we're in a pandemic and we service people that are in a pandemic. What could be what could be a bummer to me? So I don't mean to bring you down, brother, but Malden Overcoming Addiction sponsors a team in the Malden Neighborhood Basketball League, the MNBL. Sponsor the right. Sonics. The Sonics, very good team this year, Paul. The Sonics had a chance to take it all. Finally beating the mere sponsor team of, of the Celtics, but your, but your Sonics lost in the first round of the MNBL playoffs. I'm sorry, Thanks, to, end, I'm sorry to end this podcast. <laughs> I'm on my note. But, Paul, you were so close, but yet so far. <laughs> Listen, hey. We live for another day, right? We will sponsor the Sonics forever. And I look forward to, uh, to, to, to this coming year and season. And I, I, you know, again, watching that league and what you do, Nestor, um, I am so honored to be part of that. And just to, for our little bit of contribution that we get to do it with the kids is, uh, wow. But I'm glad you did mention that. And you mentioned someone else. I can't, I can't say enough about our mayor. Um, Mayor Gary Christensen, um, he's the heartbeat of the city and w without, you know, er he, the support he's given Malden overcoming addiction and he believes in the help and helping people who need it. Um, again, just the best, one of the best humans I've ever come across. And, um, you know, I, I got to give him a shout out because without, without him believing and supporting this cause, this cause wouldn't be here. There's a lot of cities and towns that, that don't have the support that Malden has. And that starts at the top. If you don't have the support at the top, you know, you can only go so far and between the mayor and the city council and the school committee. And I can go on and on. Um, 
you know, Maria Luis from the city. Just again, I, I had to mention that and, and give a huge shout out. Best city ever, best administration ever. Just a, what a wonderful place to be. Like there was a city flag that used to say Malden, a great place to live. And I truly believe Malden is a great place to live. Absolutely. And I'm going to have to have a mayor on a future podcast. Last podcast I had the mayor on, which was Dugcast number 12. We just talked about his love of arcade games and stuff. I didn't want to talk about the usual city stuff, blah, blah, blah. He hears it all mm-hmm. the time. So, yeah, but again, our mayor is an excellent and dynamite mayor. So, Paul, before we get out of here, how can the people get in touch with you? How can the people get in touch with Marlon Overcoming Addiction? So, here you go. Here's my phone number. You can call me directly at 781 838 2203. Uh, my email, you can get me at PVH Hammer Time. That's two H's at gmail.com. You can contact Malden Overcoming Addiction.com. Uh, you can go to our YouTube page at Malden Overcoming Addiction, Facebook at Malden Overcomes, Twitter at Malden Overcomes. And again, N- Nestor, thank you. And I just want hey, thank you for being a guest. And I just want to also say, if you want to get in touch with Paul Hammersley via Twitter, hashtag Mr. Hammer Time. Twitter, hashtag Mr. Hammer Time. Because Paul, because Paul, you know my philosophy. Take no promotion like self-promotion. That's right. <laughs> so, Paul, once again, thank you for being on this episode of Beyond the Rim, hashtag BTR. And I want to have you on certainly more often. I want to have you on a couple of times a year, at the very least, at the very least once a year. But I figure if I can get you twice a year or maybe quarterly, so four times a year or something like that, because again, as you said earlier, this is an ongoing recovery thing, moment by moment. Things are not going to shut down recovery wise, all this stuff. No one's going to be completely healed when this podcast is over. Hopefully, this podcast can reach. As many people we can reach. I'm gonna put on all my platforms. I ask you to put it on your all on all your platforms. And if we can just reach one person, just one person, we've done good. And when I say we, it's just when I say we, it's just me giving you another platform to disseminate your message. You and your team are doing all the hard work. So thank you. Nestor, without you. Listen, that's a huge platform that you that you uh, provide. So I am not going to undercut that at all because it's the social media platform, the opportunity that you give us to get our message out there. You know, we also have a show that we're bringing back down to Urban Media Arts. Um, you know, um, and I look forward to starting that show again. It's been a couple of years since we've had it up and running, but we've had, we've got twenty five episodes which are on. Malden Overcoming Addictions YouTube, and I look forward to starting that um, episode back up again. Thank you, Brother Hammer Time, and we'll be seeing you very, very soon. Thank you, sir. Very, very soon. Beyond the Rim is available on Apple Podcasts. Beyond the Rim is available on Spotify. Beyond the Rim is available on Google Play. Beyond the Rim is available on Stitcher. Beyond the Rim is available on TuneIn Radio. Beyond the Rim is available on iHeartRadio. Beyond the Rim is available on YouTube or wherever you stream your podcast. Visit our website at btrmike.com. That's btrmic.com, where you can stream past episodes and discover additional podcast platform where Beyond the Rim is available. Hashtag follow, hashtag stream, hashtag retweet, Twitter handle, at Nesta Dudley. Until next time, streamers, buenas noches. Coochies, coochies. I came in peace. I leave with love. This is for the red, the black, and the green. Living cool, living calm, living clean. I'm out.